Hello, I'm Anna Ray Mundy coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, I am so happy to welcome our guest, Jacob Cooper. Jacob is a clinical social worker, certified Reiki master, and a, and a certified hypnotherapist who specializes in past life regression therapy. It's right up my alley. Um, he works privately with clients through online services. Inspired by his near-death experience and transformative encounters, he facilitates spiritual awareness and empowerment through life-changing seminars. Currently, he resides and practices in Long Island, New York. He is the author of Breath, I'm sorry, of Life After Breath, published by Waterside Productions, which I assume people can get on Amazon. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, welcome. I'm so happy that you're with us today. Oh my God. Thank you so much. I had no idea you're from Ridgefield. That's where my dad grew up. So we have Actually, so much in common. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he, grew, he grew up in Ridgefield? And then he went to Long Island? He lived there for, my dad was one of these guys who was all over the place, but Ridgefield was a place that he lived. And, you know, once a year we visit his old home in the town and he tells me how much it's changed since he's been there. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful town. Yeah, really well, is. you know what? Everything's changed. I go back yeah. to Long Island. And when I grew up, you know, it was this small town, little place, kind of like from the wonder years. And yeah. it doesn't quite look like that anymore. But change is good. Change is good. Yes. So, yes. I just want to talk to you. You know, we started to talk before we went live about how it's so wonderful that you're young, you're only 30 years old, um, mm. and you've had these experiences, you know, and you're really bringing up your generation into the limelight. You know, people like me have kind of set the stage and like you're bringing it up. How, how is that for you being so young? Yeah, you know, it. Um, I think the 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 best component to it is learning how to be grounded uh, because there's a lot of judgment and stigma that people have on the old and the young and even in you know my near-death experience which I experienced at the age of three years old and a lot of people will think that that's impossible to recall that or to to hold that and you know the one thing that I really remembered from my near-death experience is we are a soul in a body we're not a body without a soul and the soul is timeless and the and the body is finite. And I try to always beat to my own drum and to not, you know, just act on how the world saw me as a blank canvas when I got to this world. There was a whole encyclopedia beyond this lifetime of references. So what do you remember from your near-death experience? Yes, you know, my near-death experience happened in September of 1993. At the time, I had a highly contagious, you know, fatal upper respiratory virus called pertussis, otherwise known as whooping cough, which for a child, infant, and even rare cases, adults could be fatal. And so I caught whooping cough. And at the time, you know, it wasn't known. And so, but I went to a, a, a park with family friends. And in going to the playground in the park, um, I got out of the car and I was going up on a ladder onto a slide. And as I was climbing up each rung of the ladder on the slide, my breathing became more belabored and more difficult. And, you know, eventually when I got to the top, there was no breath, I suffocated. And that was the most traumatizing, scariest memory of this lifetime that I could possibly have is, you know, when you say you have a headache, when you say you have this, when you say, you know, you're experiencing it and those are just words, they don't do justice, but suffocation, you know, it was incredibly scary and, uh, there was nothing that I could hold on to. I wasn't here and I wasn't there. I was just in this place in between of what felt like eternal suffering. And, you know, after the, you know, when I was suffocating, my body's was not working as if you have a car engine and the parts aren't working. You try to gun your car and it's not working. And so when my engine wasn't working, I tried to, much like if your car wasn't working, you would get out of the car and check the engine. For me, that's kind of what happened when my body wasn't working. And I got out of my body and I was able to look and understand it through a much greater awareness that I had at the three years old, never mind if I went to, you know, you know medical school or you know, neuro neurology programs. And I recognized that each part of my body was just shutting down almost as if you have a power breaker in a home and you flip off the switches through the deprivation of oxygen. 
And the last part that I was aware of was my own brain. And I was able to x-ray my brain and understand different components. And then within moments later, there was a massive snap in my brain as if you take a plug in a wall and just yank it out. And I was no longer tuned into my body. And once my brain literally snapped in half or cracked in half and was a massive sound, you know, the saying goes, that's my brain cracked and cracked open. That's when God came in. And literally that happened to me. And I've raced at an infinite rate at a journey within. And the closest way I could describe it is if you go to a Six Flags high powered roller coaster and you just go on, you know, to infinity at an infinite rate. To me, that was happening on an inner level, and I was just going upwards and upwards and upwards on a journey within, you know, down, you know, a, a familiar tunnel that I've seen uh, countless occasions, you know, and there were so many other things that hopefully we could get into, but I was aware of the closest word that I could describe it for practical state was a, an awareness of God or the palace of God, which to, what was happening to me was I was going upwards, but behind the right part of my brain, I was aware of this golden palace and I was looking at it and it was so profound, the light and the sounds, it was so diametrically different than anything of this reality. It was such an adjustment that I just almost had to shield myself. It was so potent. You know, then I became aware of a field of what I would like to describe as Christ consciousness. It wasn't that I was seeing Jesus in front of me. It was a pitch or a field or just a whisper of, of consciousness that I was that I was aware of. And it was the most euphoric, comforting sensation that you could possibly have. And you know, moments later, my body was was able to go down the slide through the sheer force of my own spiritual guides that were there on the side of me. There were a male and female guide, and they literally pushed my body down the slide when I suffocated. And then I saw that my body was flatlined, but I was to the side of my body. So I was aware that I had a form outside of my body and I saw people you know, trying to call me and they were talking to my body. And I could probably understand how spirits feel when they cross over and they see you and you don't see them. And that to me was torturous where I just wanted to shake them and grab them, but they couldn't see me. And I, you know, that didn't change for 20 years almost when I, when I, took ownership of my near-death experience and I kept it very much in, uh, you know, and so, like yes. As a three-year-old, I mean, you're three years old, three-year-old children have limited language, you know, they can speak, but limited language. And so this all happens to you at three years old. How, I mean, how did you communicate that? Like, how do you, you know, like, how do you still remember it? That kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, near-death experience researchers will attest that infants and children take around 20 years to fully integrate and process their near-death experiences. Adults who work in corporations or Dr. Eben Alexander, you know, other people, it's they have a struggle to describe the colors, the sights, the sounds within the limiting words. And so for myself, and we'll get into a little bit of why I kept it inward, but words were the furthest thing from anything that I experienced in my near-death experience. So they weren't about, you know, myself. I only verbalized it because I saw the universality behind the experience and the healing component that it could have to other people. But for myself, it was a lot more comfortable to keep it inward uh, because it was just very hard to explain. But it's important to preface that the person who was experiencing this was a three-year-old child in a sense that I had attachment to that life. There was an adjustment phase that happened. I felt as if I just got here and, you know, just a concern for my parents and the impact on them. So that was the, I, I guess, the three-year-old component. But beyond that, it was a part of me that was timeless, ageless, and limitless that this was a full-blown soul experience, which I refer to as the sacred eternal observer that is always there. It's like when you meditate, I say you don't have to have a near-death experience to experience eternity or the soul. You know, meditation is a great rapport with eternity because when you close your eyes, there's that part of you that's undeniable to meditators that just know that you that can't be taken away from you. It's not within your thoughts, it's not within your body there's this invisible force field that is you 
that can never be taken. And so for me, this was a deep water vantage point of experience that was far beyond theory old Jake. Uh, you know, if that makes sense. Well, no, that makes sense, you know, and having, you know, had Eben Alexander on this podcast twice, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, it's the light, you know, everybody who has an NDE talks about the light and that feeling of Christ consciousness, whether they use that word or not, you know, the ability to feel like they're, you know, attached and connected to God. Um, and one, you know, but I'm, I'm wondering, like with Eben, it really did change his life, you know, I mean, he went from being not spiritual at all, and then changing it where I, I don't even, he's not practicing medicine anymore. He's totally in this spiritual realm doing other things. How do you think this set the path for what you were going to do in your life? You know, within my near-death experience, I look at that as the ultimate education framework for the life that I was informed um, you know, when I was having my NDE, I became aware of, you know, a field of endless sea of angels that was in front of me. And I saw the unconditional love and healing that they were given. And the spirit guides I view as very micro individual focused, whereas the angels that I saw on a thin veil right over this world were there really to embody unconditional love and light. And so seeing that really taught me that, you know, yes, this earth is a school but it's a training ground to really learn what it's like to know unconditional love for yourself as you relate it to, to another. But the moment that I really remembered my life path was when I was given a decision if I were to stay or to go. And within that you know, moment, I was aware of previous lifetimes, which hopefully we'll get into it, one or two of those lifetimes and some of my karmic ties. And then I saw that I was speaking in front of a large group of people. And within that moment, it wasn't that I was some pompous teacher who was better than the, the group participants. It was that the message was so profound of bring the hereafter and the here now that I didn't want to turn down the window. I recognized that the hereafter is eternal, but the window of bring that into this time is a unique opportunity. And so from seeing that, I decided to stay and I buried that vision for quite some time. It wasn't until a couple of years later where I was struggling very much in my early college years it, when a woman came up to me and she said, I never spoke a word to her. And she goes, you know, you have a big crowd in front of you. I, I see you speaking to a lot of people. You're going to make quite an impact. And at the time, I, you know, that hit me on one end, but, you know, I was still caught in this temporary struggle where I couldn't see past it. And, uh, you know, and so I would say the near-death experience informed me that through the greatest, debil most debilitating experience of losing your breath or being suffocated, that what's inside of us is infinitely greater than the temporary turbulence in front of us. And I was driven on an individual and outer basis to provide that awareness to other people through my life's work. And so you talked about how when you had your NDE, you saw past lives. Is that how you got interested in um, hypnotherapy doing um, past life regression? It, it was one of them. I mean, certainly reading about Edgar Cayce and how, if you're familiar about Edgar Cayce, he's one of the most well-known intuitive trans channelers. I've spoken at the ARE before in Virginia, but his healing that came from a physical basis and how that opened up a whole world for him and I have incredible medium friends of mine who have went to Dr. Brian Weiss's workshop and they found their own inner gifts. And so for myself, the near-death experience had something to do with that undoubtedly. And some of the lives that I live, which hopefully we could talk about maybe one or two of those, because I think for listeners, it could you know, speak to what they might be going through you know, well. But I, I would say is the number one question that I have that people ask me within their work is what's my life's purpose? What's my soul's purpose? And so much of that is really muffled by the programming that we have and that we see ourselves as a smaller sense of self. And I view past life regression as a great spot for the soul, but it also allows us a, a larger framework to re-remember the tracks that were set before us. And I do the life in between life, you know, part within my regression. And it allows people to re-remember the path 
that their guides, their angels or loved ones set before them so that they go through their lives with more grace and ease and really be more in alignment with who they truly are and what they um, came here to do. Yeah, you know? I think that's really important. You know, um, you know, I also am a hypnotherapist and I do the past life regressions. And it's, it's, it's not just about the curiosity, it's about what can you learn from your, your past lives, you know, and how does it affect your life now? And how, you know, in understanding that, you can understand what's going on in your life now. So tell us about one of your past lives. Yes, you know, hypnosis is a wonderful tool to have a much greater vantage point and it's so versatile with whatever anyone is going through, you know, to find a way between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind to align someone to have breakthroughs within their own lives. The, the last lifetime that I was aware of, which has since been evidentially validated by intuitives who have never, this is long before I became public and started writing my book, was a lifetime that I was a teacher. And I remembered in my near-death experience, I was aware of countless students that I saw from that lifetime. And you know, people will say, do you have emotions on the other side? I, 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 could ex I could attest that yes, I was emotional from seeing those students. And it just, just reminded me that I just wasn't this three-year-old kid, that there were so many other chapters before this that I, have, that I wrote. But I saw within that lifetime that I really had my back against the wall and was very symbolic and allegorical with my near-death experience where that life I was breathless. I saw no hope past what I was going through. And in my NDE and subsequent experience as a child, I remember just taking my own life. And moments later, it wasn't condemned. I wasn't judged. You know, I just entered the world of eternity. And so from that experience, I understood a little bit of the karmic ties through my own soul to remember that love never ends, love is eternal, no matter what we're going through, there's endless possibilities of hope, of change, of great, of breakthrough, and also a degree of support that believes in us far greater than we could ever imagine. And so within my clients that I see who become depressed or you know, at times suicidal or, or lifeless, I, you know, and it's, it's not cut through, cut through it. Everyone's got a different circumstance, obviously, you know, but the one common denominator is feeling stuck and feeling isolated. And my near-death experience really told me how illusionary that is, that when we think we're alone, that couldn't be further from, the, that couldn't be more diametrically opposite than the truth, that there's loved ones, angels, spiritual guides, aware of our thoughts, aware of what's going on, and they are coming through us at all times with higher information, you know, to go through our different challenges with more grace and more ease. How open are your patients to this? You know, with my psychotherapy patients, obviously you have your hands tied, you know, with the licensure. And my greatest gift I would say within my practice is learning the art of meeting people where they're at. There's great beauty in that. There's great beauty in being where your feet are at and not bypassing someone's level of awareness and, and working with that. And so, you know, everyone comes at a different level of consciousness. When I write my book or do a talk, you know, Wayne Dyer would say there's a thousand different versions of me and a thousand different opinions and little, you know, whatever I say doesn't change. And so everyone comes to this degree of work with a different level of consciousness or understanding. But when more so private clients, you know, there's more so of an openness, you know, to that from reading the book or hearing, you know, myself speak. My goal was never to have monopolization of the other side or monopolization of the near-death experience. I don't want this to be mine. If this is something that I hold on to, I feel like I haven't done my life's purpose. My job is, you know, I feel that this was a gift that I was given and I had this on my back and my goal is to try to give away all the pearls of wisdom from this, what I'm carrying. And so at the end of the day, I have nothing left in the tank and I could you know, go on. But my goal is for people to not be defined by my story, but to learn ways to have remembrance of their own eternity and to have amnesia, you know, taken away um, and to see a little bit more clearly of their own eternity. Well, is this why you wrote your book? To get all of that out? It, it was one of the impetuses behind it. But I really expedited it because of the times, you know, I just saw so much symmetry 
with what I experienced in my upper respiratory you know, fatal virus and how on a literal or metaphorical basis, people were feeling out of sorts, out of breath. And so I experienced my near-death experience. My goal wasn't to just hold on to it, but rather to give what I was given in moments when my life and breath were taken away. And my biggest mission is to give back, you know, that was, what was when it was taken from me. And, you know, if I could do anything, that would be it. As I really learned as inspiration is the oxygen of the soul. And when we're inspired, when we're connected, we're, we're really able to really overcome, you know, we're able to generate hope past the pain of any you know, particular situation. But it was also for people who were dealing with grief, loss, you know, suffering. And, you know, that was a big target. And I've since, you know, joined with the Forever Family Foundation, if you're familiar with them, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be presenting with them, you know, in the summer retreat. But people who are, who have lost loved ones, people who are fear, you know, the continuity of life after death or have questions, you know, my biggest goal is to really give this over and to give people the freedom to make whatever they want out of it. You know, well, that's so. wonderful. So, but you grew up in a modern Orthodox Jewish family. How is this accepted by this? And, and how, you know, and, and what's your insight on religion and spirituality today? It's, it's interesting. I always say spirituality comes through us. Religion comes to us. You know, spirituality is inside. Religion is something that we learned in our program too. You know, I, I think it's interesting. I think at the core of religion is a spirituality, but people lose sight of that. You know, and why I say that is, you know, if you look at the teachings of Jesus or Judaism or, or, or the Islamic faith, you know, they speak about reincarnation. That's, that's there in Kabbalistic teachings, certainly. And you look at at least Jesus' teachings, the Council of Constantinople took away that in, I think, 300 AD, where he spoke about reincarnation. I think a lot of that was the desire to not individuate, but to have a group basis. And when you're having awareness of previous lifetimes that cause people to just individuate from a collective belief system. And so there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, but I would say is, you know, spirituality is very empowering in a sense. It really allows you to understand the truth within your own backyard where, you know, religion at times could be disempowering where you invest in someone else's truth and that becomes your own. I think having a solid foundation of religion with an even stronger foundation of spirituality is a great balance. You know, without that, you know, it's, it's destructive as, we, as we've seen. You know, so I think having your own connectivity and balancing that with a communal connectivity, uh, but, but also to not have the micro get lost from the macro, you know, and to not be so defined by this one wavelength of the prism, but to see the light behind the prism that we are, we are all that light. And we're not here to be above another, we are here to love another and to put the me integrated within the we. But within the Jewish faith, it was it was difficult because my experience happened a couple of weeks right before Yom Kippur, which is in the Jewish high holiday, a day in which the soul is getting ready to meet the divine creator and rid, ridding itself of its sins. And you know, and, and there's there's beauty in self-work and self-awareness and self-investment. What I recognized was a diametrically opposite version of the divine, which was a God that didn't love me for what I did, but rather for who I eternally was. And that to me was the closest thing to unconditional love. And that's very different in our today's society where we're brought up, where we get the 100, we get the pat in the back, we get the 65, where we get scolded. And there's a constant minute to minute self evaluatory transactional dynamic with unconditional approval. And I think a lot of that is based off of many things, but religion certainly has a part of that where this, you know, conditional degree of love, this black and white thinking, and the ability to not embody the beauty that we have inside of us um, is sometimes gets in the way. But the rule basis, the, the fact that you had to strive to get to heaven. The forgetfulness that we aren't just heaven, that we aren't here to bring heaven on earth, but literally we are heaven here on earth. And that's something that I remembered with my yeah, near-death experience. That's beautiful. That's one of the best explanations I've heard. 
thus far. And I'm totally in agreement with you. I think that's what it's all about. And I really do feel like we carry the kingdom within us. You know, it's about how we communicate it, but you're such an old soul. I mean, you have, you have done this job so many times, but in this lifetime, you're obviously bringing it to a higher level and you've just begun. So, I, and this is one of many books that you're going to write. It's just, well, thank you. Um, it's just amazing, like hearing these words of wisdom from a 30 year old. I mean, you know, like you could be 90 years old passing this on to people and it would make sense. You know, that, you know, I think it's just absolutely, absolutely wonderful. When, when you did have your NDA, um, what was one of the most important lessons you learned from that? Or what, what was like one of the biggest highlights? I have to thank you for that compliment. As the carpenters would say, we've only just begun, my friend. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the carpenters is pretty wild. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Karen. I, I love their music. It really speaks to me. You know, when you're an older spirit, you have an eclectic taste. Um, you're very discerned of what you want to do. And it takes a lot for you to approve of something. It has to be quality, whether that's through fragrances, whether that's through people. I'm very selective with energy and, and what well, yeah. I like, but um, the carpenters are great. But, you know, the near-death experience, what I learned, um, first and foremost is um, that we are not our bodies. We are an eternal spirit. We are an eternal soul. Uh, we didn't come here to just balance the paychecks, collect our 401ks, you know, pay the bills. I learned so clearly that this was all a spirit thing. This is all a spiritual thing. That spirituality we think as owned by a person who meditates in the Himalayas. And I, and I just learned from my near-death experience that that is the phyla and core of every sentient being. We are birthed from an eternal breath of God. And I remembered that from losing my own breath that I remembered my own you know, breath that, was, that could never be taken from me as I was born from it. And you know, in, in the Hebrew language, the word for spirit is ruach, which means the, the wind of God, the spirit of God. And, you know, that's that's a beautiful take on it. And so, like I said, you could find pearls of wisdom within within the faith, and I've tried to do that because there is beauty in everything if you look closely enough. Some people have really diverted from that, unfortunately, and that was never the intent. Mm -hmm. uh, but but yes, the wind of God that we are born into that that can never be taken from us. The fact that we can never be destroyed, we can never truly be in pain. It's only temporary. At the core of our eternity is our time is a timeless soul. I, I also understood that we weren't here necessarily for a school of life, as some teachers would say. Yes, this is a school, but it's not a punishment. It's not that we have to learn this, we have to do that. I tried to keep it strength based. We're here to unleash, to embody, to re remember who we are and to integrate that because so much of society from very early age has looked at us as a blank canvas. And thus the developmental stages are very disempowered. Physically, we depend on a parent and, and that leads to emotionally, psychologically. And we put our hands in the powers of teachers, parents, and not that that's wrong, but we're not taught at a very early age that we know the truth, to speak the truth, to know the truth. We are, we are taught that we have to learn it. We're taught that we are suffered to get there. And so I think when people practice spirituality, what gets in the way is the muscle and the hustle that sometimes people do where they project the worldly experience into um, spiritual expansiveness. And what I would say is it's a very light, gentle frequency of energy. It's a process of reduction of all the things that get in your, in your way to open you, yourself up to get to that. And as my near-death experience, I learned that to find myself, I had to lose myself. And I think that's the greatest thing for people to change is the vulnerability to let go of that. The second thing is the concept of eternity in, in infinite. When we hear that, it's finite because we all of a sudden think of infinite as one particular thing. And I learned that time was infinite. God in my own experience was infinite. I couldn't pinpoint and say the palace was God or that light was God. 
because all of a sudden that's a finite God that's measurable, that's tangible. I tried to I tried to really learn from the experience that God is in all, you know, in in all of our experiences, and the beauty of constantly evolving to a greater understanding and a greater rapport building with the infinite in ourselves and the infinite around us. And to me, crossing over wasn't um, a, a, a part that just hit the wall and that was it. It was remembrance of the eternal evolution and understanding of God, which kept life very much open-ended and not closed-ended. You know, it's so interesting when you were talking about like the all-knowing. Yesterday, I posted something on Instagram, something about knowing what the purpose of life is. And um, without giving my opinion, um, which is, I think we're here to heal ourselves, heal each other, to love each other, to love ourselves and to spread that. That's living in the image of God. And so somebody wrote, um, somebody wrote, well, aren't you going to tell us? And so, you know, my answer to her was, you know, the answer, go into mm. your soul. You know, you, you know, it's great to listen to other people, but it's got to be coming from within. You've got to feel it. And the answers are simple. They're not complicated. You know, as, as Americans, as human beings, we tend to complicate so much when this is so easy. It's just there in front of us. So, you know, in, in, in you coming out and saying these things, I think that people can understand that. I also want to ask you, what do you think Christ consciousness is? That's a wonderful question. You know, a lot of people, when they read my book, they get frustrated because they have an understanding of Christ. You know, they visualize mm -hmm. You know him, and what I say is, <laughs> not to get too graphic, but Jesus was not born in, in Chick Fil A in the South. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. He was a man from the Middle East in Israel, was born a Jew. I can't say he ever died a Jew. I'd, no one ever dies, but you know he, he was Jewish in that lifetime. But what I would say is, it was a familiarity. I viewed the life of Christ, and in a sense, to remind us that that was what what was inside of Christ is also inside of us. I think a lot of people took that the wrong way and they put that on a pedestal and they were disempowered with it. And it's just a reminder, you know, of that. Could I say that that is God? I think all is God, all is a part of God. And that is to me a high octave, a high expression of the divine. And I think ultimately each soul is an octave, is an expression of the divine. And as we climb up each ladder, each rung, which literally happened to me. And by the way, my name is Jacob. And you think of Jacob's ladder from the Bible with the angels going up and down. That literally happened to me when I was climbing up this ladder. But each lifetime is another degree to further evolve our frequency and a vibration. And as we do it, the individual and the collective frequency has a much grander symphony. And I think that's the goal within time. And this is a voice that is in us beyond this body, beyond this time, remembering that voice, remembering that the voice of the soul allows us to really project it into the world a lot a lot better and to be more uniform with that true essence, that true part of ourselves. You know, unfortunately, I don't think anyone is evil or bad. I just think that the voice that they think is theirs is separated from the true voice within. As At the end of the day, I really learned that love is the only thing that exists. Everything else mm -hmm is the only power that we give to it, but it really has no legs to stand on. You know, it, 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 it's, it's temporary, it, you know, love is eternal. So would you say that Christ is the highest embodiment of the energy of God that has existed? It certainly was, you know, up there in the trajectory, you know, what I would say. And I, I would say so, you know, that was to me, you know, I speak of frequency, that was an incredibly high frequency. And you know, when you think of infinite, there's infinite degrees of highs in a frequency and there's no end to this light. There's no end to this frequency. You know, but certainly that was an incredibly high octave that I connected to in an expression of the divine. Uh, but I would say is within each lifetime, we have different bodies, different characteristics, but beyond that is a collective theme, a collective vibration. And as we tune into the God within the, the breath that, you know, birthed us, you know, since the onset of time, 
And as we are getting closer to that, we're here to re-remember who we truly are in the eternity within. And I think we come to this human experience for many different reasons. For some people, it's boredom. They, as great as the other side is, they just get restless. They want to have something totally different than, than eternity. They want to you know, forget that and then re-remember it. And I think it's a series of forgetting, remembering, forgetting, remembering, and we're entertained by different cultures, different lifetimes. It's it's all a journey. It's all experience. And, and that's so beautiful. Do you believe that we reincarnate to try to perfect within the imperfection our souls to reside with the ultimate love? I do, I do to an extent. You know, I would say that I, it's not out of punishment, you know, mm -hmm. per se. It's not out of condemnation, but rather a beautiful opportunity, you know, that we have. And sometimes we're told that we, you know, that it's best, you know, some near-death experiences have. For me, I was given an option, but I think it's all in the power of perspective. And I think each lifetime is an opportunity through different challenges, through different moments to evolve so that lessons are no longer needed to be repeated as a greater message is embraced. And we're able to, you know, evolve to higher echelons, higher plateaus from, you know, being able to embrace that. But, you know, some people, they just constantly create the same images, the same yeah. situations, and they, throughout forgetting that awareness, that genesis of why we're here, you know, it's very easy to get sidetracked and, and, and you know, to continuing to make those same moves. But, I think within lifetimes, we're here to be more skillful chess players, where it gives mm -hmm. us a similar board, much like the Netflix documentary, The Queen's Gambit. And through every lifetime, we're able to be aware of a couple steps ahead and making more skillful moves, mm -hmm. you know, so that we could go on to, to But it takes awareness. Things. It takes it takes, it takes, it takes awareness. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Awareness. And, you know, as a medium, you know, dealing with people who have died, died young, you know, and how many times I repeat, this life is so short. It's not about, you can have nice things, that's fine, but you can't worship that. You have to make this worthwhile and you have to live. People just, <laughs> they get caught up. You know, they get caught right. up in their in their culture and their tribes and whatever. Oh, sure. going on. And it's so frustrating to watch, but that's why, you know, we have people writing books about this things. I can talk to you all day long. Um, I find you amazing and fascinating and refreshing. And for all those that are listening, I really think you should um, pick up Jake's book, Life After Breath. Um, you know, a lot of what he's saying is in the book. Um, and you're just wonderful. You're just such a breath of fresh air, especially as a millennial. Um, you know, like you're there, you got it. And it's just, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm sure everyone listening to this, um, you know, has that little spark of enlightenment going on inside of them. So, so thank you very much. And to my all greatest of you honor. Out there, um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment on um, Instagram pages, Facebook pages, YouTube channels, um, and be sure to subscribe to all our channels um, so you never miss an episode because episodes like this are what's going to bring us up and help our ability to evolve as souls and be happier as people. So thank you, Jake. My honor. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for listening.